Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Springfield is basketball city, and the Boston Celtics are NBA champs. Woo! Monty and I didn't really follow this at all, but NEPM's Kari and Jerry did, and he'll give us his take on the Celtics at the end of the show. And later, we'll head back to Sheffield for more with Mumbet Freedom Farm. But first... I have a bit of vertigo looking at all the birds through the rear window of the Hitchcock Center for the Environment here in Amherst. What's your name? Casey Beebe. And what do you do here, Casey? I am the Community Programs and Special Projects Manager here. And what's your name? Kim Snyder. And what do you do? I am the Director of Development and Communications. Apart from having an incredible building that we'll hopefully talk about and its levels of sustainability, mm -hmm. you also have incredible gardens and it's a beautiful day. So why don't you want to take us for a walk yeah. through the gardens? Yeah, so part of the Living Building Challenge is making sure that your space and your grounds are very suitable to biodiversity supporting pollinators and things like that. All of the rain that falls on this site has to be held onto. So throughout the site, we have depressions that are considered rain gardens as well as bioswales so that all the water that falls on the site kind of gets held by the site instead of running off into the street, running off to become stormwater. Um, so that's sort of element number one is trying to hold on to what water falls here. And then we have the center of our parking lot is all a rain garden and it's all planted with native plants. The entire site has to be planted with native plants with the exception of some of our teaching gardens which are sort of edibles like tomatoes and those kinds of things. But generally everything is a native plant and the reason um, we do that is we want to encourage biodiversity. There's a lot of key co-evolution where certain insects depend on certain host plants and so we want to make sure we have a nice diversity so that we're supporting all our different native flora and fauna. Are you saying um, that right in front of the milkweed for monarch exactly, reasons? Exactly, right. So and that's one of the ones crawling into one Yeah, of the, that's the one of the, of the ones fence. we tend to know is the like the we have milkweed here that just volunteered itself and we let it be. Um, to support the monarchs. So definitely later in the season, we'll start collecting those caterpillars and watching the, the monarchs form chrysalises. Oh, sweet Ooh, a butterfly. Ooh, perfect timing. That's like the first one of the season. Butterfly in the sky. Other special elements of our site. This isn't particularly attractive, but this is our constructed wetland. We are not connected to any septic or sewer system here. Um, so we are able to have a gray water system because we have composting toilets. So all of our gray water, so any of the water that goes down our sinks, just does a, a simple filter in the basement and then it comes through here and the plants actually do the next layer of filtration. So that this is sort of meant to demonstrate that. Everything is sort of meant to have multiple purpose. So whether it's an educational purpose, an edible purpose, a medicinal purpose, just beautiful play. It's all very intentional in that way. Kim, we haven't clearly like laid out what the mission of the Hitchcock Center is, but for people who aren't familiar with what you do, what is the mission? Our mission is to educate and to inspire action for a healthy planet. And we sort of do that in stages throughout people's lives. So we like to um, reconnect people of all ages with nature. So this garden is one of the ways that we do that. Um, all of our programming pretty much happens outside for the most part, except when we're in classrooms and schools, which we are a lot also. And then we kind of move on to teaching sustainable design and engineering challenges. And that is a main focus of what we do in schools. So we sort of use our living building as an example of how we collect rainwater and use composting toilets and use solar. And we kind of let kids explore that. And then often they'll have field trips here and they'll see a real living building and see how it really works in practice. And then we do uh, leadership and communication skills with teens. And that's like our climate action series and our climate collaborative camp and teaching kids and youth that they have a voice and that they can take action and make change. Um, and then we also convene adults and have discussions. We have a whole climate action series where uh, adults can come on site and learn things, see a film or, you know, hear a discussion on something and have discussion amongst themselves and sort of think about like, how can I do something in my own personal life to affect climate and take action on climate? Well, speaking of convening adults, it's probably worth noting that on Thursday night, June 20th, two alleged adults, Khalees Smith and I, will be judging along with another alleged adult, Jim Zakara of Hope and Olive, and a real adult, <laughs> Representative Mindy Dom. Try their very best 
all of their legislative tones to keep us under control. <laughs> For the Battle of the Botanicals, which is a great event that is returning now. I've been to it, I think, every year that it's happened in the past. Well, this is a really beautiful way of tying it into the Hitchcock Center here being in our gardens because we want to sort of show folks that all the food and drink and things that we enjoy in our lives comes from the earth and comes from nature and that we have to protect that in order to continue to enjoy that stuff. So we bring bring together the best restaurants in the area to compete with little delicious tasty bites and cocktail samples that sort of demonstrate botanical magic. Each restaurant chooses a botanical to highlight and they have to highlight that in their bite and in their drink. And people who come to the event vote on the best ones, and then the top three battle it off. And they get kind of given a secret box of ingredients that they then have to compete and create a drink on the fly. And then we judge them. And then yeah. you judge them. And it's <laughs> super fun. <laughs> and it raises money for education for a healthy planet. Anya awesome. is one of our educators that we're excited for you to talk to as well. And they have just been gathering dead, what did you call them? Not dead materials for take apart. Is that call them undead? Is that what I said? <laughs> it looks like a vacuum cleaner. So these are all um, broken stuff. So I'm an educator here and I'm do the curriculum building for summer camp. So this is all I just posted on Amherst Buy Nothing and I said, can you give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses <laughs> yearning to be free? <laughs> and um, so people left some broken stuff out on their porch. We're the gonna, vacuum of liberty. The vacuum of liberty. They come to America today. Hopefully there'll be interesting cogs in the take apart that will inspire them to build weird flying helicopters powered by whale song or something. Uh, <laughs> But then sometimes I'm like, oh, this is going to be amazing. The kids will love this. And they're like, I just want to make a box and then lie here in the sunshine. Yeah. So that's sometimes how summer camp goes. It can be its own form of environmentalism. Yeah, Solar power. Let's go inside and meet more people. We're going to go inside the living building. So does that mean it's going to yeah. eat us? It's yeah. not going to eat you. This is our Western Mass's version of Howl's Moving Castle. Yeah, right? I mean, Down in the basement somewhere is a fire demon. You're a first class fire demon. I like your spark. My spa. Here we are inside the lobby of the of the Hitchcock Center for the Environment in Amherst, where there is all sorts of taxidermed animals and some turtles and fish and stuff. This beaver definitely looks like it wants to be interviewed. How's it going, beaver? I'll leave it to you. But gee, Wally. Can I bring you guys over to the ecotone? Sure, the ecotone. The ecotone is what we call this room that is the space between our two buildings. So on one side we have the visitor center and our office space, and on the other side we have the classroom space. And this is genuinely my favorite room in the Hitchcock Center. I really love the way the Hitchcock Center is this like, you know, earlier I was talking about this opportunity for kids to vision better climate-oriented futures. And I think this room really pulls a lot of it together. Um, it's thinking about the macro and micro level in this center. So looking around, what do you guys notice as you're looking around this room that looks unusual from another building you might be in? Well, it's got four tanks in here and all sorts of big pipes. It does. So the tanks are about big enough for me. I'm about uh, five, two and a half on a good day and the tanks are all about big enough for me to curl up inside of. Tanks are called our first flush tanks and you can see on them there are markings. There's 164th, 132nd, 364th, and 116th. So when I do this tour with young people, I I invite them to sort of hold their fingers up as close together as they can in front of their eyes and still see light. And that's about a sixteenth of an inch. That sixteenth of an inch of rain across our roof fills up all four of our first flush tanks. Our roofs are designed to catch rainwater. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so what I think is really cool about this room is that it's inviting us to think about water on a micro scale in terms of like all of the water that falls just on the roof of our building, but it's also inviting us to think about water on this macro scale. So you might notice on our floor is a map of the Connecticut River, and oh, nice. when I do this tour with young people, I invite them to stand in the Connecticut River and stomp around. <laughs> uh, kids love like a somatic element. I like this because, you know, to our left, we can look all the way up to Vermont and New Hampshire where the Connecticut River 
starts and then to our right we can look all the way down to Connecticut and beyond that theoretically to the ocean where the Connecticut River ends and thinking about this watershed right we're thinking about the water on our land that's coming into our building ideally that we can use for drinking but we're also thinking about the whole watershed and we're thinking about the health of the watershed and like literally when we're on this land it's our responsibility to be thinking about what we're putting into this land and how it's going to connect into the Connecticut watershed and then eventually into the ocean. I really love this room. It's just like combines art and engineering in like my favorite nerdy way. <laughs> I'm Katie. I'm one of the educators here. I'm actually, um, as of July 1st, the education director here. Congratulations. Um, thank you. I am a mega fan of native plants. So anything you want to know, you can ask me, but I actually came over here to tell you about the composting toilet. So <laughs> is, is my rage at bittersweet warranted? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, when I work in my yard, it's not even fun because bittersweet just, like, makes my life totally miserable. It's insurmountable. Is there a native plant that can beat bittersweet, or do you need to get a goat? I would pull it out by your hands, and I, I mean, I think it's a lifelong thing. You have Once you get it all out and you eradicate it all, it's, it is going to keep coming back. Um, so plant your native plants and then continue to weed for the rest of your life. It's a sentence. It's like your hands, it never really goes away. Yeah, the gift that keeps on giving. Bittersweet is a really good example of a plant that's really damaging to humans and to its environment. But like um, Robin Wall Kimmer, who we really love here, talks a lot about Phragmites and the way they uptake carbon at like really rapid rates. And so even though Phragmites are, you know, can be really damaging to wetlands, they're really teaching us something about how we're going to have to adapt to climate change. And I think that's really at the heart of something we're thinking about. Let's go use the composting toilet. <laughs> Later in the show, NEPM's Kari and Jiri on the NBA champion Boston Celtics and more from the Berkshires with the activist freedom farmers at Mumbet Freedom Farm. But next, Monte will fulfill a lifelong dream of conducting an interview from a toilet when we check out the composting bathrooms at the living building of the Hitchcock Center for the Environment. Their benefit, the Battle of the Botanicals, is this Thursday in Amherst. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Cause poop. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by the UMass Five College Credit Union, offering co-op advantage checking with cash back on all purchases, plus secure debit card controls, all from the UMass Five mobile banking app. Insured by NCUA, umass5.coop. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. We continue our tour of the Hitchcock Center for the Environment in Amherst, where we have arrived in the magical bathroom. Step right this way. So what we tell kids when we um, come into our all-gender restrooms is that when you walk up to our toilet, they look pretty normal at first, right? It, it, there's a bowl, there's a lid. Um, and then when you get up closer, you look inside and something's missing. There's no bottom inside this toilet. There's no water. <laughs> and no water. There's no water inside our toilet. It's a giant hole that goes down forever. Yeah, so you see a bowl, you see a hole, just like any other conventional toilet, but the water is missing. And so I always turn to my, the children in the audience and I say, why would there not be water in our toilets? And they might provide this answer, which is because it's clean drinking water and water is a precious resource. Yeah. yeah. That we poop in in this country, but that yeah. other people fight are going to be fighting wars for if they haven't started already. Exactly. So we say here at the Hitchcock Center, we treat water like a precious resource because it is. Water is life. Everybody who's alive depends on water. Why would we poop in it? The way we do it differently here is that all of the stuff that goes down that hole, the poop, the pee, the toilet paper, composts down in the basement. Now, without water in the toilet bowl, it would get dirty if we didn't have a way of keeping it clean. And so what you do before you go is you press this flush button on the back. It's a little square button and it says the word flush and you can hear it start to hum. I'm sitting on the toilet while conducting this interview, by the way. <laughs> so it also feels good while this hum is happening. <laughs> So as the um, toilet starts to hum, you look down and you see that something's starting to flow down there. Oh yeah, like suds. Yeah, so you have a little bit of water, about three ounces of water, mixing with a special biodegradable soap that creates the, that foam that coats the bowl and keeps it clean. 
And so it's not water that keeps it clean, it's this sudsy foam. And that is also like a biodegradable soap. So when you go down into the basement, which I'm very happy to show you, you'll see that like this is where um, there's a big black tank where all of this stuff goes and it composts. Are you able to use human compost for growing at this point? I know that there's been some legal issues surrounding that in the yeah, past. So there are legal issues surrounding <laughs> this, and we, we tell kids it's not legal yet. Uh -huh. And there's um, an organization up in Vermont called the Rich Earth Institute. Oh yeah, we've heard about that. Yeah, that's working on, you know, working on the safety of using human compost, at, or human waste compost <laughs> in like agriculture, but no, it's not legal yet. So what do you do? You, oh, it's, it's tied into talks about alternate methods of corpse disposal as well. That's so fascinating. I would love to learn more about that. I think with this, it's like there's some pretty dangerous bacteria in human poop that we need to be convinced gets totally eradicated through the composting process. I don't, I bet with like human body decomposition, there's other things, prescription medicine and like the chemicals that our bodies are full of. Like we'd, we'd want to be convinced as a society that all that stuff is um, breaking down with the composting process if we're going to put it on our agricultural crops. What are you doing with this human waste compost meanwhile while it's not legal to use it agriculturally? So get this, we've never needed to empty these bins. This building has been open for eight years and we've never had, to, it's not full. Well, wait till you let me have a couple minutes in here. You give me the New York Times and you're gonna be in big trouble. So the, That's such a big job to take on, Monty. You are partially superhuman, but I'm not entirely sure you're up to You're, you're gonna wanna light a match. That's all I wanna tell you. Well, the, there's no smell in here because we have the fans going. And so like when people, when we say composting toilets, people are like, ew, isn't it gonna be stinky? Cause they have like life experience with using composting toilets that, you know, smell like really a bad. Like oh, yeah, porta potty, porta potty or, or a house. Like a house. Yeah. yeah, the ones I used at summer camp. But like, we do have fans in here that keep the smell like totally non-existent. So I'd say it's like less smelly than a conventional toilet. I also love how on the wall. I yeah. just saw this. Whose scat is that? And it's illustrations of animals and what their poop looks like. Yeah. yeah. So not only can you poop, you can learn about poop while you're in this Absolutely. bathroom. Don't judge them by the, the shape of it because some of it definitely looks like, are you okay? That's normal for them. <laughs> normal for them. Hi, I'm Monty. Hey, I'm Billy. Hi, nice to meet you. Billy, you're the, you're the new executive director or new-ish? I am. Yeah, I've been here almost three years. Tell us about uh, where you've come from to lead this Hitchcock Center for the Environment here in Amherst. So, and Billy uh, Spitzer is your yes, full name. Yes, I lived in Boston for many years and worked at the New England Aquarium. Uh, oh, yeah. I can walk like a penguin. Exactly. <laughs> what a giant turtle. I can walk like a penguin. Did a lot of work actually on climate communication and climate education and I realized that's kind of what I wanted to do with the rest of my uh, working life. And I was kind of looking for a way to do that and found out about the Hitchcock Center, a place that was devoted to environmental education, but really thinking about climate change and sustainability and, and hope and educating young people. And I thought, this is the place for me. And you heard there was a cocktail related fundraising event. So you were like, I'm there. Yeah, I've been waiting for my first battle of the botanicals for this year. <laughs> um, and uh, every everybody I connect with around the Hitchcock Center is like, oh yeah, the battle, that's like the most awesome event. So I'm really excited about it and excited you guys will be there. What's your vision, Billy, bringing this institution that's already so forward thinking in so many things it does with the living building with the way that the land is set up here educating the youth in how they can get more involved in rescuing us all for the damage we've done to the planet what's your vision going forward well one of the big things i've been working on is thinking about how this center is a resource for the broader community not only in greater amherst but also in uh, Hamden county um, as well as in Franklin County, and we've been increasingly partnering uh, with the public schools in Springfield. We have a three-year project that is working with all of the third graders in all of the classrooms uh, throughout Springfield Public Schools and helping them learn about sustainable design and engineering um, in the classroom, but then also come here and see it in action. Mm. Um, it's a really wonderful project. We've learned a lot about bus logistics. Uh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> doing a ton of field trips to get to get kids here. We've also been partnering with the Y in Holyoke uh, and bringing programming out to them as well as sometimes bringing them here. A newer project we've been working on is all about uh, air quality, climate, and health. And we're working with the Public Health Institute of Western Mass uh, down in Springfield, who have been building this network of air quality sensors throughout the whole Connecticut River Valley. And the idea is that if we're gonna fix
fix the pollution problems, we have to know where they are. And these low cost uh, air sensors enable us to really on a pretty fine scale figure out where the small particles are in the air mm. and what we can do to, to fix that problem. So I can actually show you our air quality. Yeah, yeah. Let's go check it out here at the living building of the Hitchcock Center for the Environment in South Amherst. Going back outside to the beautiful garden. This is a, uh, a low cost air quality sensor called a purple air sensor. And it measures really small particles, um, so small that um, you can really breathe them deeply into your lungs. Um, they're much smaller than the size of a human hair. Those particles come from uh, automobile and truck exhaust, wildfire smoke, industrial activity. We have about 50 or 60 or the, of these sensors um, up and down the valley. And so um, we can tell on a given day, you know, is this a good day to be outside and exercise or is it a day you really need to be inside? Mm. And we also help people. And I should say that the yeah. sensors are, they're small. They look like a, a light bulb fixture without a light bulb in it almost. Yep. Yeah, they, they're really small and, and inexpensive. The, the guts of them is just a, a little device that um, pulls in some air with a fan and then uh, there's a little laser that uh, shoots at the air and then detectors that uh, measure the light that gets scattered by the particles. These have been calibrated against the really uh, high quality and expensive EPA sensors, of which there are very few, um, but these we can afford to put in a lot of places. So we use- And they're the, called purple air sensors? They're called purple air sensors. Do you have any purple rain sensors? Uh, no, we don't have any purple rain sensors. That's a great idea. I think that's a great marketing opportunity for their company. But I think uh, so too. I think they will have a really hard time getting the rights. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Prince, Prince is, is notoriously true. litigious. I never meant to call you his team now that he's passed are way worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We also help people learn how they can um, build their own uh, air cleaners. With basically uh, a box fan and a furnace filter, you can set yourself up. So if it's a, you know, a bad, bad air quality day, you can actually protect yourself. And we used these all last summer on a day-to-day -day basis for our summer camp to decide what activities would be safe for kids to do. And people often don't realize that even though we live in this, you know, this beautiful valley, um, we still are uh, subject to pollution, um, partly because the valley holds air, mm -hmm. um, especially when you get an inversion. And also, um, you know, the air blows in here from all over. So um, we really do have to pay attention. I think the wildfires really helped drill it in for people that um, there's only one atmosphere. And, you know, people think often, oh, I live in Amherst, I'm, you know, wh why would there be any pollution? This is not only a watershed, it's actually an airshed. Um, we all share the same air. What we also find is that um, the air quality and uh, impacts and climate change impacts are really related. More heat means worse air quality. More heat means more extreme heat you have to pay attention to. And, you know, they're caused by, you know, common causes. Vehicle pollution, other pollution makes the air quality worse and also is usually putting out CO2 that contributes to climate change. So common problems, but also common solutions. And I think the more we can get the community educated and behind this, uh, the more we can make changes. Just out of morbid curiosity, what level has it gotten to air quality wise here? On the worst days last summer, you know, basically the recommendations are not to be out and active unhealthy air but, quality. But they don't give you the codes for the, the colors yet. Yeah, oh, no, they do. Okay. They do. And, you know, we were getting up toward the kind of red zone, ah, um, yeah. which is not, not where you want to be. No. The other thing that happens is that, you know, the wildfire smoke was on top of whatever existing pollution there was. So places that are normally experiencing more pollution, particularly um, neighborhoods that are uh, near I-91 in Springfield, their baseline level is higher. So the wildfire smoke really put it over the top. Mm. But even here, we still had unhealthy, unhealthy days. I think it has really brought up people's awareness about the fact that we all share the air, we're all responsible for climate change, we all need to work together. And you know that's what this whole center is about, is helping people figure out how do we live and respond to climate change? How do we help young people really become hopeful because they're problem solving? They really can use the tools of engineering and design and problem solving to really address uh, the world that we're all growing up in. Billy Spitzer, Executive Director of the Hitchcock Center for the Environment in Amherst. Battle of the Botanicals is Thursday, June 20th at Amherst College. Got a favorite style cocktail? Oh, wow. I had, uh, uh, you know, one of my few martinis a few weeks ago, and boy, it was powerful. So I'm looking forward to trying some. Is there a particular botanical you're hoping shows up in your glass? I, I love mint, so that's, that's an easy one. Love stuff with mint and looking forward to something refreshing. Everybody gets real creative at this thing, so I think you're going to be impressed. 
Currently, our air quality is not terrible, even though it's super hot and gross outside. We're riding around 57 percent is what 57 is where it looks like it's in the yellow zone. Basically, everybody's yellow, but Sunderland. Yeah. Way to go, Sunderland. (laughs) Later in the show, we've got Kari and Jiri, our very own, talking about the NBA champ Boston Celtics. But up next, we'll wrap up our tour of the living building called the Hitchcock Center for the Environment in Amherst, where we'll hear about their extraordinarily cutting edge way of purifying rainwater, their youth climate action programs, and we'll follow their compost composting toilets down into the basement. It wouldn't be us if we didn't. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. Do you want to learn about youth climate leaders? Kind of, yeah. Around the world? Hoping sure. to talk to you guys a you little bit about... You mean those awesome about... pictures you have yeah. on yes. the wall in the other room? Yes. yes. We're back inside the living building of the Hitchcock Center for the Environment, and we're learning about youth climate leaders. Yeah, so right behind me on the wall, there's a bunch of posters of youth climate leaders all across the world, and I was kind of hoping to use this. Um, First of all, it's amazing, and if you're nearby, you should come see this exhibit. It's in our back hallway, right across from this art about our living building. On the way to the composting toilets. And on the way to the toilets, which are also a highlight. I would say the poop picture, make sure you see that. But I wanted to use this as a jumping off point to talk about some of the work I do with youth mentorship. So I'm lucky enough to mentor a youth climate leadership team, which is a team of high schoolers from all over the Connecticut River Valley who do all kinds of youth organizing work. And the big thing they do every year is they throw this summit, which is all of these high school students together from all schools all over. And in the morning, it's an instructional how-to about how to do climate work, how to lobby to your local representatives, how to make climate art and theater. Um, We had a representative from the Healthy Air Network last year. And then in the afternoon, the schools put together a climate action project, which is something they take home and work on for the rest of the year. So I think last year, uh, Northampton High School put together something about pollinator gardens. We've had solar panels. We've had replacing plastic forks and spoons with reusable utensils. That one's hard because the apparently the hardest block on that one is that the teenagers will be so used to throwing out their utensils that they'll just throw out mm. the, the metal forks and spoons. See also almost any festival in the area where yeah. we're tra- like you'll have all three bins yeah. and signs with pictures about yeah. what to do. And at the end of the festival, everything is everywhere. Yeah, it's so hard. I definitely don't envy festival cleanup. That's like a whole thing. It's hard, but shouldn't be. That's the question as activists is how do we, where's the block, right? What, do people need education? Do people need things to be easier? Do, you, do people need things to be clearer? So that's, I think, a lot of what these youth are working with. It's not just that we're like, oh, these youth, they're, you know, they're going to exist for a while and we want to give them tools for the future it's also that like youth climate action is some of the most radical and inspired climate action and when I say lucky enough to be an adult mentor I really mean it one of the things we are always talking about on our youth team is that youth don't know what's impossible so they just do it our job as adults is to get out of their way and give them the tools we they need and just figure out how to make the impossible happen. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. That's something I really like working on. As the 23rd certified living building in the world, um, we're considered some of the first people to attempt this kind of ambitious design. And as such, we ran into a whole bunch of hurdles. And it was kind of nice to have the Kern Center doing the exact same thing on the same campus um, and kind of running into those hurdles together. And so we have we have the same builders. We have the same like water engineers. And so we were all kind of grappling together with like all of these hurdles. We came up against stuff that was illegal and we we, like pushed back. Um, So this is 100 percent testing ground and sort of like a opportunity to challenge existing laws and codes to be like well like we're actually providing something even safer because it's so much healthier for the earth when you build a building like this you're putting pressure on the existing systems to be more environmentally friendly I don't know if anyone's told you about the red list yet, but there's a whole list of materials we weren't even allowed to use when we built this building. It's called the red list and PVC is on there. Who can build a building without PVC pipes? Like we had to figure that out. And once you like put pressure on the industries to provide more sustainable materials, the more and more people that put that pressure on the industry, the more readily available this stuff is gonna be and like the more accessible this kind of building is gonna be for residents, you know, other businesses. Let's go see the poop in the basement. I'm not going to say no to an opportunity like this. So this is part of our uh, living building tour. Um, If you come 
here, whether you're a student, college student, or um, adults, we have architects, we have professors, we have all kinds of people will come here on tours, and this is part of it. So as you can see, it's, oh. there's a lot of like inner workings of the building. It's used for storage, but there's a lot of um, infrastructure that is kind of on display here. And something that we say on every tour is that you know we're an educational organization. When we designed and built this building, we wanted everything to be as transparent and educational as it could possibly be. So we left things exposed on purpose. Um, and this is you know, an example of that. So as you can see, we've got some solar panel infrastructure over there. We've got some rainwater filtering over here. I get really excited about this part of our our building. Our building is designed for all of the water to be consumed on site. So when you fill your water bottle, when you wash your hands, that three ounces of water per every toilet flush, that water is all designed to come from the rain. And so um, we have a pretty sophisticated filtration system to make that water drinkable. So over here, the first thing it passes through is the five micron filter. A micron for reference, uh, one human hair is about 70 microns. Filters. I don't have any microns. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the five micron filter. It filters out particles that are five microns or larger. And then the water gets treated with calcite right here, and calcite will make it more alkaline because water from the rain is, uh, tends to be acidic, so we make it slightly more basic so it's closer to neutral. Um, and then we have um, an activated carbon filter, which is basically like a giant Brita filter. And then after that, it, we get to the really unique part of our filtration system, which is our ultraviolet radiation tubes, which is like, this really interesting way of making water safe to drink. The only other place I know that has this system is the Kern Center next door on Hampshire College campus. Basically, it treats the water with UV light not to kill the bacteria, but to render them sterile. So here's the thing. When you get sick from contaminated drinking water, it's not because you drank water with bacteria in it. It's because the bacteria that you drank then multiplied and made you sick. So when you drink water with sterile bacteria, you're not going to get sick. You have a water <laughs> spaying and neutering. Yeah, always yeah. remember to have your water <laughs> spayed and neutered. Have your pet spayed and neutered. That's exactly right. And then you get to the one micron filter. So this is going to filter out particles that are one micron and larger. It basically can't get any cleaner than that. And then it gets stored in that, that tank for until it's ready to use. I do want to be totally transparent that this part of our building is not operational yet. We haven't fully jump through all the proper hoops. We are using water from the town of Amherst for now, and we're working really hard to get this up and running. Onto the poop. There's two restrooms side by side, so here are the two composting tanks. They're like probably 10 by five. Yeah, giant black plastic tanks with a little handle, and I'm gonna open this door for you so you can see what it looks like inside. It looks like wood chips. Yeah. It looks like like what would be in your rabbit bin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So a bunch of sawdust, some brownish looking liquid, and then you have this big pump in the corner. And so the poop that actually still looks like poop is up here in this part. And then it basically is getting combined with a whole bunch of sawdust, a whole bunch of microbes, and even red wiggler worms. Yeah. And it, it is breaking down at a super efficient rate. Do you smell anything? No. Nope. Right? So there's, we have this fan system that's like the, the exhaust system that's blowing the stinky fumes out. It doesn't smell at all. The liquid waste does get pumped out, and that's what that pump is. And it gets pumped into these white tanks and treated, and then that gets hauled away by a traditional septic hauler. So the liquid waste isn't part of this process. It gets Just pumped out fairly regularly, yeah. Like I said, it is so efficient that we haven't had to have it scooped out in over eight years and we don't expect to for many more years. Wow. <laughs> so it's a super efficient composting process. So hopefully by the time there is enough to scoop out and remove, it will be legal <laughs> to use as agricultural <laughs> compost. We're here at the end of spring getting in towards your summer programming, but I'm looking at sleds and snowshoes. Yes. Do you, does anybody from an education want to talk about what you do education wise in the winter? Yeah, so we have winter field trips that we will um, outfit kids with, with these snowshoes if the snow is deep enough. That hasn't happened in several years. Mm. I'm not optimistic we'll get to use those anytime soon, but we do have just as many programs running here in the winter as we do in the summer. Um, we're very busy with after school programs, homeschool programs. We have winter and April vacation camps. 
and then the sleds are super popular for those those less structured um, free nature play style programs so I have an after school program I'll pull those out if the snow is deep enough but it hasn't been in at least two winters yeah. nothing depressing about that no <laughs> there's a lot of doors here yeah. they all go to places thank you all so much for giving us this great tour of the Hitchcock Center here Casey Beebe, you've been to all the battles of the botanicals. What's your favorite kind of cocktail? I love anything with mezcal, and I love interesting botanicals. I'm excited about... No, I won't give any hints. Can you tell us what the restaurants are that are going to be competing? Yeah. So we have the Jardy Truth in Northampton, also representative in Northampton Homestead. We have Esalon. We have Gumbo Nola Kitchen and Oyster Bar, that new place. 30 Boltwood here in Amherst. We have Harvey's up in Turner's Falls. Oh, oh, oh. My kid works there, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. No Bias. nepotism. Johnny's Tavern. <laughs> and the Powerhouse is a really fun venue, so we're really excited to have it there again. And thank you all for participating. We're really thrilled for you oh, all to come. Like, judging show, alcoholic show beverages. Show up somewhere and drink cocktails <laughs> so hard our lives. <laughs> Thanks to Casey Beebe, Operations Manager, Billy Spitzer, Executive Director, Kim Snyder, Development and Communications Director, Katie Curtin, Education Director, Manya Reyes, Environmental Educator, and Allie Martineau, Communication and Marketing Coordinator, all from the Hitchcock Center for the Environment, for giving us that tour of their living building. You can join the two of us, as well as Hope and Olive's Jim, Jim Zakara and State Rep Mindy Dom, for cocktails that will support the work of the Hitchcock Center at the Battle of the Botanicals this Thursday evening at the Powerhouse in Amherst. Learn more at HitchcockCenter.org. Up Come drink with us. Yeah, up next <laughs> We'll head back to Sheffield to take one last tour around Mumbet Freedom Farm. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. NEPM's podcasts are funded by Armbrook Village Senior Living in Westfield, offering assisted living and compass memory support with evidence-based treatment for those with memory loss. More at armbrookvillage.com. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, helping customers make the switch to solar for savings, energy security, and tax incentives. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. Let's head back to the Mumbet Freedom Farm to talk with Sundar Ashney and Adrian Seneca Bello and perhaps advise a bit about getting yourself to there. We did have a little bit of a difficult time finding this. But, yeah, yeah so, I but mean, I'm glad Google we found thinks you. the road is wrong. <laughs> yeah. Well, our land partners are Racebrook Lodge, which is a whole other, you know, history lesson and story that this is Race Mountain behind us. And the brook that is right here on this side of budding the, budding the farm is Race Brook. Um, and Race comes from the family Johannes Race. It was a Dutch settler that came here. Um, and so that's where the name of this property, the brook, comes from. And I always am like, well, I really want to know the original names of this place. So if anyone out there mm -hmm. has any, you know, inkling or information about like about that, I, you know, we would love to hear. Yeah, there's this is so much more land than I was expecting. Like you see the part that's protected basically from too much wildlife interference oh, yeah. um, but like there's so much more land that's actually attached to this you all came at a good time because the forecast was like thunderstorms all day oh, yeah. long and it rained this morning I so feeling like it wants to do it but hasn't it done does it, yet. it wants it so bad <laughs> it that way it'll happen eventually so we are here on stockbridge muncie mohican land here in sheffield massachusetts it's also, I realize, that also territory of the Scaticoke mm -hmm. Nation, which is not, not a, the large part of the territory. Sure. We're largely in Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican territory. And so these indigenous peoples of this land, we're extremely grateful to them for tending to this place way before we got here. Mm -hmm. And maybe Adrian can speak a little bit of the, the history, and then we can talk more about the tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know as much history about the Scaticoke folks, but I do know, like you were saying, that a lot of territories kind of like overlapped upon each other. So this is part of that. They overlapped over here. And also there's a lot of movement around these areas. So I don't have like the lineage of exactly where they were and how they got moved out. But usually the story is quite similar that there was a lot of violence and illegal land sales and cohesion and stuff like this that happened. But I do have a pretty straightforward lineage of what happened with the Mohican folks that were here. And that started in the 1600s when Henry Hudson showed up, who was a Dutch trader. 
and now we see his name everywhere. He showed up and he was like, oh, this is great. I'm going to set up a, a trading post up in Albany. It took him like four years, which isn't a lot for that time. And then after that, it just snowballed and a, a whole bunch of different people came. And the Mohican people who were already like movement people that lived near waters mm -hmm. were starting to have to move around, not in their regular way, not in their migration way, not with the waters, but now because of the violence that is going on and the constriction of the land and all. Of so all of these things start to shift their way of life and eventually Stockbridge is set up as a mission for the Stockbridge Indians, which are Mohican people and also like a mixture of a whole bunch of other native people around. So like Mohawks were there and Lenape and all these other people came to Stockbridge to find some like safety but also it's a mission, so they're getting converted into Christianity and civilized, right? And so they're there for a while, but war is happening and more violence over the lands of this area. So eventually they decide that they have to leave and the Oneida Nation, which is a Haudenosaunee nation in New York, invites them to go and live with them. Oh, this is the 1730s. They make their way over there, which is a long, a long journey on foot. Yeah. <laughs> So they go and live there. There's there's some people that also break off and go to Indiana. They're just trying to find somewhere that they can be, be peaceful and be on land. So some of them are Indiana uh, with like the Delaware and the Miami, and some of them are Oneida. And then all the Indian removal acts start to happen, especially in upstate New York. And then they get moved in the 1830s to Wisconsin. And so that's an even longer travel. And most of them did it by foot. So most of them walk all the way up to Wisconsin they find a nice place. The Mohican people, they're named the people of waters that are never still. Mm -hmm. So naturally they find a really great place with a waterway and they settle and they're like, okay, we're here. And then it's recognized that they found a great place and that waterway is really important. So then they get moved again. <laughs> um, and now they are like stationary in the place that they were moved to. And there was also probably so many other stories intertwined in that whole thing. But I like to give that lineage just as an example of how much they've gone through and how many times they had to be moved and moved and moved and how resilient they are. Even though I don't know the lineage of what happened to the Shattuck, I'm sure that it's very similar, that all this movement was happening because of this violence. And it's just a really good thing to keep in mind when we're here of how much people have gone through and how much they've tended to this space and how important it is when we're doing this work to understand those things and to recognize those ancestors and those spirits are still here right now with us. And as we're doing this, we have to like honor them and remember them, be in relationship and continuously make an effort to reach out to these folks and be in relationship so they have access to this and have leadership in what's going on here. Here we are. And then we can pass by. That's our little kitchen there. Ooh, there's guac in the kitchen. <laughs> there's guac in the future. Do you have relationships with other organizations outside the Berkshires that are doing similar things in Western Mass, besides they keep bees? I mean, there's Woven Roots, which is awesome. Ontarium, Jen Salinetti is an amazing being. She's also she's been in this region for 20 years doing farm work. There's Elizabeth Blackshine with Harmony Homesteads that also has been doing work in this region. There is Double Edge Theater and Andre uh, Strong Bear. Strong Bear. Strong Bear. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm connected with them actually. Ebony Noel Golden, who yep. is their creative director, is going to be coming in July. We're doing a week-long residency with her here oh, as an oh, artist. Cool. And so we're going to have a performance oh, the third fun. weekend and Saturday, so you're welcome to come back. That's great. There are so lots of other things. I don't know if I can tell you all the things. No, right no, no, yeah, yeah. But what I will say is that the 6th, 7th, and 8th of August is a day that you're going to want to come back and visit us here. There's something really exciting happening that I can't talk too much about, but I think that's going to be really amazing. And I'll tell you more about it as I know more, but I will say to the readers or listeners or whoever, just like save that date in your calendar as something, another special day to come and be here with us. Has it been hard seed saving here? I love seed saving. <laughs> <laughs> we have been working with an amazing being, Lex. Lex is amazing. And Lex has come like for the past two years to help us with our seed savings. So we saved a lot like the sunflower seed, 
calendula, uh, marigold seed, nasturtium seed. We successfully did wet seeds last year with Lex's support, tomatoes, tomatillos, peppers. So, I mean, I would say that the challenge is like the wet, getting the wet saving. I just love seed saving. I love seed saving. I love growing from seed. <laughs> it's just like the most amazing thing. It's challenging in its own right, but I just, I just love it. And then it's just, it just shows you just like how abundant, again, that abundant. I mean, I'm just like, just look at nature, y'all. I mean, just look at tobacco. <laughs> look at that plant. Like, a tobacco plant. So when it grows, it gives off this, like, flower. Like, the sepals and all, like, that, that stuff, right? And then that flower bud, the flower petals drop, uh, drop off, and then that dries. And then inside one of those tobacco pods is, like, 500 seeds. And there are, like, 10, 15, 20 on one stem, and so I'm just like, there's, there is a way and nature has a key and we need to start listening. <laughs> like for real. What are some things you're looking forward to in stewarding this land? Hmm. I mean, I feel like part of the, the thing that looking at like cure, cultivating, understanding, restoring the earth. I just been thinking a lot about um, relationship. Like that's the priority this year and not just relationship between me and other humans i'm very interested in that as well but you know relationship between ourselves and this earth that is holding us and supporting us i was just thinking about how generous and compassionate and abundant this world is like with the amount of things that have been done throughout time over time by so many and yet the sun keeps rising we still have amazing, beautiful water that's flowing here. And I think about our responsibility to care for that and to not just care for that, but to actually um, have some sort of reciprocity where we give, where we're actively creating spaces where the earth can be restored. You know, and there's this guy that gave a talk recently over here called Joe Brewer, and he's really into like bioregionalism. And I think, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking a lot about um, relationship building here on the land with the earth, but also even within this region and other people within this region of really getting together with people. I mean, this is a Berkshire's, people have a lot of resources here. And I'm just like, yo, like, let's use our time, money, um, thought, mind, power to come up with strategies. There's no reason why things need to be continuing to deteriorate. So I really am invested in and interested in being a part of a regenerative movement so that our earth can heal, you know, and like waters can be restored. And I don't think that it's so idealistic. I just think that, I think it's actually the most practical thing. <laughs> just, you know, take care of things. Just, it's the only option at this point. Yeah, yeah, you know? And so what can we... So I'm interested and invested in actions and activities and radical visioning with Black, Brown, and Indigenous people. And it's not only about returning, but it's about like how can we use what we know now people, to, people, to restore. We are all our people. To end the show, the Celtics are for the 18th time NBA champions. NEPM, Skari and Jiri, you've been following the now 18-time NBA champs. In the minute we have left, tell us what you love about this team. Well, what I love is is that the, the concept of team play was evident throughout the season and, and the postseason. Despite their two stars, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, both stars in their individual selves, they managed... I guess under their coach, they managed to downplay their individual game and, and for the betterment of the team, which featured Al Horford, the, the eldest member of the team, uh, Drew Holiday, Derek White, and Christos Porzingis. And they managed as a team to dominate the league and into the regular, in the regular season and into the postseason. That's what I love about this, this, uh, this sport that, uh, that often emphasizes individual uh, statistics over team play. But this was an occasion where team play actually 
was so evident uh, when they played the Dallas Mavericks, who had two stars of their own, but who didn't manage to show up. And, of course, the the other members of the team, well, they had to follow behind. And But this was a, a team effort all the way. I feel like that's happened with the Celtics in particular every time that they've risen to, like, every time they've had an ascendancy. Like, you can see them gelling as a team on the court. Um, like, I remember, like, the first time I saw that happen was, like, when Rondo joined the team, actually, and, like, just saw him do things as a point guard, even though that team never won a championship. But, like, seeing the seeds of them gelling in the way that they played with each other, and every time they're able to make it happen, they really make it happen. They did. We should mention that Rajan Rondo did, the last time they won, which is 2008, Rajan Rondo was on that oh, team. Oh, yeah, that's right. I love that they always win on 6-17, too, 6 one We're at fabulous 4-1-3. they got to win in April somehow. <laughs> Kari and Jiri, thank you so much. You were happier than I think I've ever seen you when you walked in this morning because of the, the championships. So. It was a good day. Good yeah. night. <laughs> well, tomorrow's Juneteenth, so enjoy that. There's all sorts of stuff we'll have on the show, but I do want to give a quick shout-out. Greenfield's Juneteenth celebration happening tomorrow in the Energy Park and a big... Thank you to our friend Empress Benu for putting that on in Greenfield. We'll see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. New England Public Media is funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Coming up next on All Things Considered, President Biden today announced new executive actions to protect an estimated half million undocumented spouses of U.S. citizens from being deported. Angela Stent, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, talks about Vladimir Putin's visit to North Korea. 30 environmental, health care, and labor groups have filed a petition urging the U.S. government to include heat and wildfire smoke in its definition of major disaster. Meanwhile, leading athletes and climate scientists are warning that extreme heat will make it impossible to hold the Olympics during these summer months. And filmmaker David Lynch plays a game of wild card with NPR's Rachel Martin and talks about his upbringing, uh, his upbringing and learning from failure. More on these and other stories are ahead on NEPM WFCR, 88.5 FM in HD, Amherst, WNNC, 640 AM Westfield, streaming at NEPM.org, NPR News and Local Perspective for Western Mass. All Things Considered is funded by WFCR's partners. Amherst, Hampshire, Mount Holyoke, and Smith Colleges, and the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And by Cerner Heating, oil and propane delivery, service, and installation with their blue and yellow and sometimes pink trucks, CernerHeat.com.